super cold. Like, what is this, minus three? This is ridiculous. Anyways, I'm glad to see that you all made it on time. You heeded my warning last week, and uh, that's great news. Um, I don't have very much to say. Um, there is cake this morning after the service, and the cake is because Innocent passed his PSW course. So we will celebrate. Is he in here? He's not even in here. Anyways, so that is why we're having cake during Lent. It seems wrong, but I think it's the right thing to do, right? <laughs> Um, just a reminder that Reverend Jonathan will be away on holidays next week and that Reverend, Reverend Jim Johnson will be taking our service. So that's great news. Um, otherwise, I don't really have anything. Does anybody else have any? Oh, we got somebody. From the Oh, uh, the license plate? Yeah, we dealt with that. Those lights will go off in about a half an hour. Isn't Thank you. Isn't technology amazing? <laughs> it's amazing. God is good. <laughs> So we will begin our service and uh, we hope that you will be able to join us after uh, for some coffee and conversation. Thanks. Nehemiah 9, 5 to 6. Then the Levite leaders called out to the people, Stand up and praise the Lord your God, for he lives from everlasting to everlasting. Praise his glorious name. It is far greater than we can think or say. Then Ezra prayed, You alone are God. You have made the skies and the heavens, the earth and the seas, and everything in them. You preserve it all, and all the angels in heaven worship you. Let's sing together, There is a Redeemer.
we come this morning once again to hear the good news of God's kingdom, that our hearts would be filled with the love of the Father, that our actions would be shaped by the teaching of the Son, and that the words would be filled, we would be filled by the spirit of hope. Lord, in this hour of worship, kindle in us the light of your love. Let's gather our hearts in prayer. Let's pray. God of love, you alone are God. You've made the skies and the heavens, the earth and the seas and everything in them. And so we gather here today to praise and to worship you. And as we worship, we pray that you would kindle anew the light of your love that is Jesus Christ, our Lord. May our time together today be pleasing in your sight, Lord, for you are our audience today. We're doing everything we do as an offering to you. As we step outside of time for an hour or so now, remind us again just how incredible you are. Sometimes, Lord, it's easy to take you for granted instead of being humbled in love. Settle our spirits, center our hearts, and open us up once again to your Holy Spirit. Envelop us in your gracious embrace and remind us again of your never-ending unmerited love. Change us from the inside out, Lord, that we might share your light and love with everyone we meet. And when we fall short, we trip up and sin. Forgive us as you always do and redeem and reconcile us as only you can do. May we never settle for anything less than Jesus. Surprise us with your mercy and your love, God. Humble us and equip us for whatever it is that you would have us do. And now we pray using the words that Jesus instructed his first followers to use, saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. 
and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. We are all forgiven and we are all loved by God in Jesus Christ. This is the good news, right? God looks at us and says, you are my child. And he loves and forgives each and every one of us. Amen. Please stand if you're able, and we are going to sing Mighty to Save. All right, today we're going to talk a little bit about Jesus as the light of the world, and I'm going to tell you a little bit of a story. I've got to think, I guess it was probably four years ago now, in the school that my kids used to go to in Whippy, they used to go to Mediba, and I know, where is Amanda? See, that's big for you, right? <laughs> I used to go to Mediba once a year, and we went. Uh, I can't remember when, when did we go, Jay? What month was it? Do you remember? No. October. October. Okay, so we went in October. So it's getting a little bit chilly, you know, and, and the one night, we went for a couple nights, and, we, and the one night, they said, okay, at, at around four, or maybe, no, it was after supper, so it must have been six o'clock, we're going to meet for a fire. And so we were over here, somewhere down in here, and where we were going to have the fire... It was quite a ways away. You had to go across the field, and then you had to go up through some bushes. It was kind of on a hillside. 
and we were going to have the fire up there. So we all went up, a whole bunch of us went up there, and it was, and it was still kind of light out. It was around 6 or 6.30, something like that, I can't remember. And we sang some songs, and we did some exercises, some games, and a whole bunch of different things. And by the time we were done, it was really dark. <laughs> it was really dark. The fire, right? And it, was, it was time to go back. And so I reached into my pocket, and I pulled out a flashlight. And the group that I was with was a cabin full of, I don't know, eight or nine boys. And it turned out I was the only one with a flashlight. I was totally shocked. Everybody's told to bring a flashlight, right? I was the only one. I remember one kid came up to me and said, hey, I need that. He said, give me that flashlight. And he went to take it, and I said, no. And he said, I said, no, no, I, I'm the only one. I need to lead the way. And I kind of laughed. He said, that's not a very Christian thing to do. <laughs> Aren't you going to give it to me and share? And I said, well, I am going to share. Let me get it back to the bright light. I'm not going to give it to you. I'm going to lead the way. And you really couldn't see where you were going. Like, it was really bad because you had to go down through a bunch of bushes. So a couple of the, a couple of the boys, ah, oh, Mr. Tate, I can't see where I'm going because they were off the path. And I was over here with the flashlight. And I said, well, why don't you all come around me and follow me and we'll go. Jesus is the light of the world, right? If we don't follow him, you know what happens to us? We end up hurting ourselves, right? We get caught in the bush. We, maybe even we get lost, right? He is the light of the world. And I was thinking that that night. I was thinking, man, are we fortunate that we have this light? Because if we didn't have the light, we would have been all scraped up. We, a lot of us had shorts on still. I had boots on up to here. It was kind of wet. But shorts, we would have been all scraped up. We would have been a mess, right? If we don't have Jesus in our lives and his light shining on the pathway and guiding us where to go, we end up lost or a mess. Let's put our hands together, close our eyes, and let's pray. God, we thank you for sending Jesus. Jesus, we thank you for coming. You are indeed the light of the world. And sometimes we get in situations like where I was at Mediba, where it's really obvious that we need a light to guide us, to keep us safe, to lead us back home. And we pray, Lord, that we'll never take that for granted and we'll remember that, yeah, Jesus is the way and the light. And we pray all this in his precious and powerful name. Amen. Carolyn is at the back. You can turn the lights on again, Ellie, and she will lead the way to the bridge. Okay, so we're in the fourth week of Lent. We're in the third chapter of John's Gospel, fourth week of Lent. This is a kind of a, a famous passage, one of the most famous uh, verses in the Bible. Some of you may recognize it when you hear it. If you don't, don't worry about it. We're going we're gonna to pray to hear it anew and fresh anyways. Let's, uh, let's take a moment to pray before we, before we hear God's word. Let's pray. God, open up our minds and our hearts and our spirits to your wisdom today. Bless us with your Holy Spirit. These aren't just any words, God. These are your words. They've been preserved for a long, long time. They're here for a reason. We're led to read these ones today for a reason. And we just pray that uh, we would be teachable and receptive to your goodness and your Holy Spirit today. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. John chapter 3, picking it up at verse 14 on through to the end of verse 21. It goes this way. This is midway through a conversation Jesus is having with Nicodemus. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. 
For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him shall, shall not perish, but have life eternal. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the, in the name of God's one and only Son. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly what they have done has been done in the sight of God. So we're back in John's gospel again today. We're picking it up on the back end of an interaction that Jesus has with Nicodemus. And Nicodemus was a member of the Jewish council. He was a smart person, right? He knew his scriptures. He was smart. He was wise. And just prior to our passage, Nicodemus comes to Jesus at night to ask him some questions. And as part of their discussion, Jesus talks about being born again. And in that dialogue, there's a distinction between flesh and spirit. In verse 6, just prior to our passage, it goes this way, Jesus speaking. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to spirit. And this, this on the one hand, and then on the other, there is this over here. Two separate things is a key theme in John's gospel. In the beginning of John 3, it's flesh versus the spirit. And by the time we get to our passage for today, it's light versus darkness. Indeed, at the very beginning of John's gospel, the difference between light and darkness is highlighted. In John 1 verse 5, it's the light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. So you've got light, dark, flesh, spirit, good, evil, lasting and fading, right and wrong, heaven and hell, saved and condemned. This versus that, especially light versus darkness, is huge in the gospel of John. And Jesus is always at the center of these competing things. He's the difference maker. He is the right way to go. He's the one that leads us in the right and best and most faithful direction. People are living in darkness, and Jesus is the light that changes everything. And the light of Christ is born out of God's love. In verse 16 today, we have one of the best known verses in the entire Bible, and one of the most powerful as well. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him will not perish, but will have life eternal. God's love is so powerful that it saves, and it all happens in and through the person of Jesus Christ. As we've walked through the season of Lent together these past few weeks, our guiding principles have been three things, right? Our frailty, Christ's sacrifice, and God's power and strength. Our frailty, Christ's sacrifice, and God's power and strength. In the opening line to our passage today, Jesus cites a powerful passage with a striking image that reminds us of all three of these things. He says, just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. If you're familiar with the story of the Exodus, right, the movement out of Egypt towards the promised land, you'll know, no doubt, that there was 40 years of wandering in the desert, right? They're freed from slavery in Egypt, and then they wander for 40 years, God's people, the Israelites, before they get to the promised land. And those years included a significant period of whining and complaining before arriving home in the land that God had promised to them. Numbers 21, starting at verse 4, is the reality that Jesus is referring to in our opening verse today. It goes this way. They traveled from Mount Hor along the route to the Red Sea to go around Edom, but the people grew impatient on the way. 
They spoke against God and against Moses and said, why have you brought us out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? There's no bread, there's no water, and we detest this miserable food. Then the Lord sent venomous snakes among them. They bit the people, and many Israelites died. People came to Moses and said, We sinned when we spoke against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord to take away the snakes from us. So Moses prayed for the people. The Lord said to Moses, Make a snake and put it up on a pole, and anyone who is bitten can look at it and live. That's why we have the symbol in medicine today, right? It's a pole with a snake wrapped around it. So Moses made a bronze snake and put it up on a pole. Then when anyone was bitten by a snake and looked at the bronze snake, They lived. For the Israelites, it was that simple. Just look up in the direction of God and you will live. And in a certain sense, it's the very same for us today. God has provided this same way for us to be healed of sin's deadly bite. Our salvation happens when we look up to Jesus, believing that he will save us. Our frailty We've all been affected. We've been infected by sin. We're snake bitten, if you like. We need a savior. We can't save ourselves. Second part of Lent. Christ, he is hung up on the cross to die for us, to save us. And third, God's power. Resurrection, empty tomb, everlasting life. The people in the desert had lost their way. God's chosen people, they've lost perspective and they were living in the darkness. But the people grew impatient on their way, the scripture says. Sound familiar? Have you ever been impatient? I've been impatient, right? We all have. I know I'm going to get there, God. You know we're going to get there, so hurry up already. Let's get there. Enough. What about the next part? They spoke against God and against Moses and said, why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? There's no bread, there's no water, and we detest this miserable food. Sound familiar? Why this way? Why are you doing it this way, God? I don't want to do it this way. Let's do it my way instead. Anyone ever felt that way? We all have, right? It's as if the people had got up and shoegazing. Do people still use that phrase, shoegazing? We used to use it all the time. Don't be a shoegazer. Don't just look down like this, right? The people had got up, got caught up in shoegazing, looking down only, just this way. God needed them to look up. So God sent, what, snakes to bite them, to get their attention and wake them up from their slumber. Venomous snakes even. Some people died. Many people, it said, died. God wasn't fooling around, was he, as they wandered through the wilderness, It's pretty serious, right? They were bit. If they didn't look up to him, they died. Wake up. Look up, God says. Many people died. Many people still didn't look up. Jesus hanging on the cross isn't fooling around either. It's serious. If we don't look up to the cross, we die. And to look up to the cross means to believe. And to believe is more than just intellectual agreement, right? Or a quick nod of the head. Yep, I'm good, I believe. Okay, it starts with that. But to believe means to put our trust and our confidence in him and know that it is he alone that can save us. When the Israelites got bit by the venomous snake in the desert, they looked up with intent, with trust, and with confidence When the person beside you gets bit and doesn't look up and dies, and you look up to be saved, you know what? You start looking up with a whole lot of intent and a whole lot of purpose, and it becomes very serious. That's how God wants us to look up to him with a serious, right, intent going, man, if I don't look up, I'm going to die. I need you to save me here. Whoever believes in him is not condemned. But whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. All we have to do to be saved is believe. Whoever doesn't believe, though, is condemned. Light, darkness, right? Salvation, condemnation. It all hinges on whether or not we believe in Jesus. To believe is to put our trust in him that he can indeed save us from the deadly bite of the snake of sin. To not believe is to reject and to ignore him. 
Momentary doubt, right? That's a whole different thing. We all have that. Disbelief isn't momentary doubt. We all have that. It's not the same as unbelief. Unbelief is outright rejecting or ignoring Christ completely. And it's crucial that we know the difference, right? Because we all have doubt. A moment of doubt isn't going to kill us. But rejection and ignoring will. Some of those Israelites, no doubt, in the heat of the moment when the sun was beating down, who suddenly got nipped by the snake in an ankle, had some doubts. Oh, man. Doubts didn't kill him. A doubter can still look up to the cross with a tear in his eye, humility in his heart, and cry for help. But someone who looks at Jesus on the cross and says, that has nothing to do with me, and rejects or ignores him, well, that's another outcome altogether. And that one doesn't end well. Jesus is talking to a very, very smart man in Nicodemus, right? He was of the highest religious order. He would have studied. He would have been respected. He was knowledgeable. Jesus is talking with someone who knew the Old Testament well, the Exodus wandering in the desert, Numbers 21, the people getting bitten by the snakes and many dying. He would have known all that. So Jesus is direct and on point with Nicodemus. God loves you, Nicodemus. God wants to save you. He sent his son to save you. And if you trust and obey, believe and follow the son, you will dwell with God eternally. But if you reject him or ignore him, Nicodemus, if you hide in the darkness and the shadows, you came to me at night, you're already in the darkness. Why wouldn't you come to me during the day? Something's wrong here. You're a dead man if you stay hiding in the shadows. Remember how God saved his people from slavery? Nicodemus would have been going, yeah, yeah, for sure. Remember how God God saved the people from deadly venomous snakes? Nicodemus would have been going, yeah, yeah, for sure. He would have said, well, God is still saving people the same way today. Only this time, it's through his son, Jesus Christ. Nicodemus would have been following right along with the stories and the events. They would have been familiar to him. One way of looking at our passage today is to say that without Jesus, we're all dead. That's a bit of a downer though, right? Who wants to leave on that? But it's true. Another way of looking at it is because of Jesus, we all have life. Life abundant, life eternal. That's a bit of an upper, right? That gives us some hope, a better tomorrow, and a better eternity. Without Jesus, we're floundering around in the dark, lost, snake-bitten, headed for disaster. Thankfully, that's not the full story or the end of the story. God comes with this beautiful and bright, big light into his creation. And suddenly, everybody can see, and it becomes crystal clear. The way home opens up. Oh, there it is. It's obvious. We don't have to bash our shins on the coffee table anymore or trip over the shoes in the hallway that are in our way. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up so that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son that whoever believes in him would not perish but would have life eternal. The second part is crucial too. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world. Many people think that, right? They think Jesus and God are harsh condemners. No. But to save the world through him. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. Jesus is that light God's love is more powerful than anything else in all of creation. Death, sickness, enemy, evil, sin, they just take a back seat. We have new light, we have new life, and we have Jesus Christ. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Let us pray. God, sometimes you give us a simple reminder. I feel like this passage is a simple reminder, a powerful reminder that there is light and there is darkness. Jesus is the light, and all we have to do is follow him, look up to him, put our trust in him. And I pray, Lord, that we would look up to him just like those Israelites did who were snake bitten, with a, with a sense of desperation, with the need for saving, knowing that, hey, man, if we don't look up, it's not going to end well. So God, thank you for coming in Jesus. Thank you for sending and shining his light for all to see. We pray in his name. Amen. Please stand if you're able as we sing Jesus Messiah.
word says from Romans 8 verse 26. In the same way the spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. We have the opportunity to try to put some of those groans into words with our prayers of the people. The good thing is if we don't, God hears them either way. If you have a prayer concern or celebration you'd like included, raise your hand and I will get to you and we will include it. Naomi. The right attitude, right? Like, yeah. Yeah. Brittany at the back. Got it. Thank you. Amanda and then Linda. Yeah. I have two. Um, my grandmother, 93, loves Jesus. I was in, admitted to the hospital a few days ago with uh, atrial fibrillation, the heart, and um, fluid in the lungs. So either Jesus take her home soon and, and peacefully or heal her. Kind of either is okay. Um, and then the other one is I've been dealing with sciatic nerve pain for the last month that is difficult when I work a desk job. Um, so just pray for a healing for that, which is why I've been looking funny up here sometimes too. <laughs> we didn't notice, or I should say I didn't notice. I don't know. I can't speak for everybody else. <laughs> Linda. Jim, he suffered a massive brain hemorrhage, and uh, he's in ICU. We haven't that this was last Sunday. I haven't heard anything else, so I'm assuming he's still in ICU. But they're uh, they have quite a extended family here, and prayer, and prayers for his wife and his family. And God's will. Yeah. So it's Jim, but not your Jim. Yes, just to make it totally clear. Yep. Any other? Yep. Young, eh? Only 66, yeah. Tough. Got another one. Oh, yeah, Tanya.
And that's for Jacob, right? Yeah. Whew, that's hard to stand by, eh? Yeah. Okay, let's, uh, let's gather our hearts together and let's pray. God, we want to come before you humbly in prayer today. Got a number of uh, situations that we found words for that we're going to share. I want to begin by holding up the Lehman family today, Lord, with the passing of Lisa. So that's daughter-in-law to Harry and Doris. Be with them in this time of loss and grief and uh, give them some comfort and some peace. Lord, a prayer of thanks for Naomi's stepmother, Marcia. We thank for her before. We've prayed for her before. We give you thanks for the strength that she has been given, that she displays. And often, Lord, that is uh, an inspiration uh, for others. Lord, we want to pray for Brittany's sister going through a divorce, and she's saving up some money, and somebody broke in and stole some of that savings. I mean, that's like a double hit right there. Um, maybe this person will come to their senses, maybe return the money. I don't know. Either way, we pray for her sister and uh, in, in this difficult time and getting hit, you know, one after the other. And as Brittany said, we pray for her to look up and to have the Lord in her life. Lord, for Amanda's grandmother, 93 years old, admitted to the hospital with fluid on her heart and her lungs. Either she's going to go to be with you, Jesus, or she's going to be healed right now. She's in the in-between time, and she's suffering. So whatever your will is, um, we just pray that we will be open to, to that, Lord. For Amanda, her sciatic pain, Lord, we want to pray for relief and for healing uh, for her. We're glad she's here today. You know, maybe the pain could have been so bad she couldn't, couldn't be able to be here. That's, that's not the case. We give you thanks for her, and we pray for relief and for healing. Lord, for Jim and Linda's friend, their friend named Jim, suffered a brain hemorrhage and is in ICU. We pray for him, Lord. You know, whatever's going on there, we know that your hand is in that process, and we just uh, pray that you'll keep him and his family uh, close to your heart. Lord, for Laura and Mark's mom, only 66 years old, they were close to her. She passed away this week. Boy, that's got to be a big challenge for them and for the rest of the family. So be with them, Lord, in this time of grief and uh, pain and trying to adjust, right, without mom being around anymore. So give them comfort and peace as well. Lord, for Tanya and her family, particularly for young Jacob, we pray waiting on some test results, trying to figure out exactly what the best uh, pathway forward is. It's so hard, Lord, to stand by and watch one of your little ones in pain where you feel kind of hopeless and you're not sure what to do. So we pray for Tanya and her whole family, particularly little Jacob. Lord, in our prayer corner, in our bulletin, we also want to pray for Sue, Jasmina, Roscoe, Bennett, Rachel, Henry, Reverend Carol Smith, Daisy, Natalie, Bill, Sharon, Bruce, and of course Lisa Lehman, we mentioned her earlier, who passed away this past week. God, take all these prayers and the ones that we heard in our opening scripture verse that we can't find the words for. Maybe they're a grunt or a silence or a moan or a groan. Whatever it is, you, you know what's weighing heavily on our hearts. Take them and do with them what you know is best and most faithful, Lord. We entrust them all to you, and we do so in the precious and the powerful name of Jesus, the one we know and proclaim, both as Lord and also as Savior. Amen. Please stand as we sing, To God Be the Glory.
Indeed, praise the Lord. Go in peace, and may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the friendship of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and also forever. Amen. Of course. <laughs> oh yeah, that's the old the old hymns are all not really meant for What's that? the old hymns are not meant for no, no, uh, guitar, no, right? Yeah. Totally unplayable. <laughs> <laughs> but, but oh that uh, yeah, that's sciatica. Oh, I 